Greetings friends, welcome again to my game room. You know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Games of pure chance aren't really games. Uh, in my humble opinion, in order for something to be a game, the game player needs to be able to interact with the game pieces, needs to make some decisions, needs to have some strategy or at least some tactical decisions to make during the game. So games of pure chance are not really games. Uh, however, they are fun activities, betting on uh, the results of a die roll. We know that as long as dice have been around, there has been betting on the outcome. Uh, not just dice, of course, but just about any kind of randomizer that you can think of. People have gotten excited about tempting fate or courting luck, however you want to look at it. There are a lot of real fun activities that are pure chance. That's why people will sit there in the casino and pull the handle on the one armed bandit all day long. Casting dice have obviously probabilities about them, but unless you can apply those uh, results, the probability uh, is just a matter of chance. The subject of this week's video is a game that goes back many hundreds of years. Uh, 16th century was when it was first recorded. Uh, there is a game board in a museum in Munich, Germany that dates back to the 1580s. The game was simply called the Game of Seven, uh, based on the fact that the number seven is the one that comes up most often with two dice, two six-sided dice. Now here's a little slideshow that will show you just a few of the variations possible. I just simply searched uh, on this game on the internet and came up with this stack of images here. So you can see that the game of seven has been configured in many, many different ways over the years, over the centuries. The game eventually evolved into a arrangement of numbered spaces that more or less resembles a house. The game has been known over the years by many, many different names. Uh, some of those include Funny Sevens, Evil Seven, The Seven Drinks, Pink, Jeu de Juif, Jeu de Set, Gioco de la Barca, Arlequinspel, Lucky Pig, and The House of Fortune. In the 19th century, particularly in Great Britain, uh, it was not unusual to see people in taverns and public houses that would be playing Happy Pig. It's essentially the same dice game. Now the name Gluck's House and the uh, modern configuration of the game is actually very recent development. It was in the 1960s that a German fellow named Erwin Gloniger uh, took the dice game and a uh, configuration of a board that was related to a medieval card game and kind of combined the two and coined the name Gluck's House, which is German for the House of Fortune or the House of Happiness. Now, since then, the game has gotten very popular with uh, reenactors of medieval history. Uh, it's an easy game to teach and play and have fun with, and it does have medieval roots. And it can be a really fun uh, party game, uh, something easy that people can just join in without having to engage their mind too heavily and uh, just have fun with it. And it can be played with any number of players from 2 to 12, I suppose, although it gets pretty crowded. I pretty much recommend 4 to 6 as a, as a nice happy number uh, to play. You can actually play the game using a deck of cards to uh, configure the board. Uh, as I say, the configuration is somewhat arbitrary, but if people are familiar with the Gluck's House board layout, uh, the cards can help to facilitate that game in a familiar way. The players uh, start the game with whatever cache of chips they would like to use. It's uh, there's not a hard and fast rule as to how many chips players have. It really depends on how long you want the game to last. In a true gambling sense, it would be whatever change you have in your pocket or whatever chips you might have purchased uh, to play these games. Now here's what happens when we play the game. A red player rolls a six. So that means there's no chip there, so I put a chip on the six. The blue player rolls an eight. There's no chip there, so I put a chip on the eight. The green player rolls a nine. There's no chip there, so I put a chip on the nine. 
the white player rolls a 10. There's no chip there, so I put a chip on the 10. Back to the red player, a 4. Now, if I roll a 4, that basically is a lost turn. Nothing happens, pass the dice to the next player. So the blue player rolls a 9. There's a chip there, so the blue player gets to take that chip. The green player rolls a 9. There's no chip there, so he puts a chip there. And the white player rolls a 7, so we put a chip on the 7. Now, the 7 space is unique. If another player should roll a 7 after that, you do not take the chip off the 7. It just adds up, and that stack gets deeper and deeper and deeper as people roll 7s. Okay. Now, if someone rolls a 2, then they get to take all the chips off the board except the 7. Okay, that's what the 2 does. If someone should roll 12, they get to take all the chips, including the 7. Now there's a couple of different ways you can play that 4. If somebody rolls a 4 and it would normally be skip a turn, I mean basically you don't get a turn, but there are house rules that say if you roll a 4 then you get to buy the next round of drinks or you get to uh, have a special token maybe for a door prize if it's a, for a charity event or something like that. Um, and this is a great game for charity events where people are willing to uh, invest in uh, whatever contribution they might want to make. And you can play it so that if somebody rolls at 12, all the money on the board goes to the charity. Uh, you can play it such that each chip is another chance to win a door prize. Uh, there's a lot of ways it can apply to that. But basically, when you're playing the game, that cycle of rolling dice and placing chips or taking chips just goes on until one person wins all the chips in the game. I have seen it in uh, larger events where people are coming and going a lot, that somebody gets eliminated from the game, they run out of chips. Somebody else just takes that chair with the requisite number of starting chips, and it just keeps going. And it could go all day long and that pot grows like you wouldn't believe and gets huge the game goes on and on some people play that even though you have no chips in front of you, you still roll because there's still an opportunity to get chips and continue on in the game so that's entirely up to how you'd like to play the game if you're playing with m ms or peanuts or something like that you know the whole family can get involved and have a good time um, attempting to win more treats but it teaches how probability works, how often that 7 comes up, how seldom the 2 and the 12 come up, so that when kids are playing it, they get appreciation for how those dice probabilities work. And so I think that pretty well thumbs up Gluck's house, and uh, I would definitely in invite you to look around the Internet. Um, there are a lot of boards available that you can buy, but of course it's a pretty simple board you can make uh, very easily just with a piece of paper and a pencil. Or you can get very sophisticated and do things with inlays and parquetry and all kinds of fanciness, too, if you'd like to. And so, as usual, I would uh, definitely like to invite you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Click the little bell there so that we'll let you know when a new episode drops with uh, new information. If you have suggestions or questions, by all means, put those in the comments section here. I will do my best to answer those and the list of games that people want me to uh, review and, and teach is uh, constantly growing so by all means get your uh, request in so that I can address that in the future as well. Visit the website and uh, our various stores online and uh, hopefully you will join the New Venture family of game players. I yeah, really appreciate you being here and like I always say, be sure to play every day.